Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join host George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture. The most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support by reviewing us at iTunes and visiting U.S. Modernist Massive Archives at usmodernist.org. And now, one of the world's top two modernist comedians, Frank King. What? There's another one? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh. I should hang up now. By now, oh, I shouldn't mention to hang up because we're, we're live, aren't we? Are we? No. Yeah. <laughs> There's another one, Frank. His name is Tim Ross, and he's from Australia. He's going to be on the podcast in a couple months. Damn it. That rat bastard. There goes my <laughs> Pritzker prize. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, I can't wait to meet him. Uh, uh, a, uh, a kindred spirit, I guess, as it were. Yes. Uh, okay, guys. By now you know, and how could you not, that U.S. Modernist goes to Palm Springs yearly for an incredibly popular architecture event called Modernism Week in February. No, who wrote this? It's not Modernism Week in February. It's it's uh, February. They have Modernism Week. Man, you guys need an editor. It's a, it's a fascinating array of sunshine, architecture, lectures, parties, tours, exhibits, and you can even order martinis for breakfast. Hello. Our own George Smart was there earlier this year talking with today's guests, who spoke during Modernism Week. We joined George Poolside at the Hotel Skylark, talking with Penelope Seidler and her daughter Polly Seidler, and documentary producer Daryl Delora, who created a compelling documentary about Australian architect Harry Seidler, I'm guessing somehow related to Penelope and Polly. Oh, Polly's dad and Penelope's husband. He's also the producer behind The Edge of the Possible, the story of Jan Utzen, George? It's Jorn... Utzon. The producer behind The Edge of the Possible, the story of Jorn Utzon and the Sydney Opera House. I've seen the Sydney Opera House. That is when you sail in on a cruise ship, you, you get a chance to see, it's amazing. It is. It's it's an incredible building. Support for US Modernist Radio comes from Mod Homes Realty. If you're having a hard time finding or selling a modernist home, Sarah Sonk of Mod Homes Realty is a wonderful, intelligent, lovely single lady who loves NASCAR. <laughs> There's a small subset of women. Maltese dogs, well, that's, yeah, they don't wear tube tops. Maltese dogs, French fries with mayo and pomegranate martinis. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. That's her eHarmony profile. <laughs> no, no. Sarah Sonk is an ace real estate agent who gets modern like you do. She's totally into it and has the expertise, experience, and track record to close your deal. ModHomesRealty.com or 919-601-7339. And also brought to you by Quality Fabricators of Benson, your one-stop shop for anything modernistic. they got your flat roofs, your big windows, and heck, they'll even put in one of them sub-zero freezers in your kitchen for just 500 bucks. Their secret, the Sears Father's Day sale, <laughs> and a little silver paint. The boys at QFab work for half the cost of real professionals with actual education and experience. Go figure. I mean, how hard can it be? Call Gene at 919-355-8837. 919-355-8837. Best to call before noon, because that's when he goes fishing. They take cash, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and of course, Bitcoin, the Red Bull of currencies. Let's go to Palm Springs and Modernism Week. This is George Smart with U.S. Modernist Radio, and we are here poolside, again, in beautiful Palm Springs, with not a drop of rain anywhere, and a perfect temperature for the moment before it drops into the freezing temperatures. Sitting poolside talking with Penelope Seidler and her daughter, Polly Seidler, and also producer Daryl Delora, who are all in town, to talk about a film about the Australian architect, Harry Seidler. Uh, this is not a well-known name in North America, but it is becoming one. It is a very well-known name in Australia. So welcome, all of you. Thank you. Thanks, George. So, Penelope, tell me a little bit about your husband and how he fell into this adventure of modernism. My husband was born in Vienna in 1923, 
And when he was 15, the Anschluss happened, which was the merging with um, Germany. Yes. And he was of Jewish background, so he left Vienna and went to live in England. He was taken in by a lovely English lady, and he went to school there and enjoyed it. And when Winston Churchill came to power in 1940, um, after a couple of weeks, he was interned as an enemy alien in England. He was only 17, and he was sent to the Isle of Man and then transported to Canada. And eventually, after he was not very happy about the situation, but uh, he was accepted after a while into a Canadian university and was able to into the University of Manitoba, which is in Winnipeg, straight into second year. And he finished at a very early age. I think he was only 20 or something, and he became a registered architect at 20, 21. 21. And then he, became, he won a scholarship to Harvard University under Walter Gropius, and he became uh, an evangelist for modernism from then on for his whole life. And he, after he finished at Harvard, he worked with Marcel Breuer in New York, and Gro he asked Gropius, how can I augment my visual um, sensitivities about architecture? He, he says, I know all about the building, but... Um, I'm less educated in the visual world. So Gropius sent him to North Carolina to Black Mountain College to yes. study with Joseph Albers. And so my husband was well acquainted with the previous Bauhaus masters. Meanwhile, on another planet or another continent, his parents, who he hadn't been living with since he left Vienna, ended up in Australia. And it was the last place in the world Harry wanted to go to. But finally, when the letter came, we want you to design us a house. And he thought, a client. Ah. <laughs> a client did it. So he thought that coming to Australia, um, south in the Southern Hemisphere, he would go first to Brazil where another of his heroes, Oscar Niemeyer, Niemeyer yes. was living. And so he went there and worked with Oscar for several months and then tried to come to Australia from Chile, which is just across the water from Sydney. But there was no just connection. Just a few yes. miles away. Yeah, yeah yes. but there was no connection. <laughs> Finally, he had to travel all the way up from South America and he finally left um, United States in Los Angeles, where, by the way, he um, met with and got along quite well with Richard Neutra, who is also from yes. Vienna. Vienna, yes. Anyway, he arrived in Australia in 1948, uh, a, a young man, built the house, and it became an instant sensation, this modern house, and it's well described in the film which Daryl Delora made, and uh, Darryl, you'll be interviewing Daryl in a minute. So, and after that, he established a practice in Australia, and for some curious reason or other, he became controversial. So he's oh, described surprise, as... surprise, surprise. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. So I, I, mar I married him in 1958, which is um, on my 20th birthday, and he was 35, 35, and we had a very exciting life. We traveled extensively, and I became an architect, and I think other people can speak after that. I think I've done well. well, well <laughs> you've now, covered it all. <laughs> well, there's a lot I haven't covered. We're only at the beginning of the practice, but it's quite a lot, isn't it? Harry and Penelope's daughter is Polly, who's with us. Tell us a little bit about the Rose Seidler house and how it was just amazing to people in Sydney. 
Well, the Rose Seidler House, it took a long time to actually complete because after the war, there was very limited building materials. So while my father had finished the design in late 1948, the house itself um, was not finished until late 1950. And just before it finished, my father did a very lavish mural on the... Um, on the balcony there. He'd been inspired from his time in Brazil with Niemeyer and the um, murals by Portinari in the works in Pampulha. And uh, so he did this very, I guess from having studied the visual language from Albers, he did this lavish flamboyant mural. And the house, um, I think, well, the things at the time that were controversial today seem so mainstream, like a house with a flat roof. Oh, yes. It's not really that controversial now. <laughs> and walls uh, of glass. Walls of glass. Um, but he said it was just, at the time, Australians, he said what was different from working with Breuer in New York for well-to-do clients in Connecticut, um, in the Upper East Side, he said there, those who were interested in modernism were the well-to-do and the elite. He said, whereas in Australia, he had a far more... It was the average person going, oh, I like that open plan, open space, the light. Can you, can you do one of those houses for me? You know, so he, he liked the sort of egalitarianism of Australia at the time. And they were all gaga over everything American. Like he talks about going and getting a driver's license and the man, he presents a New York driver's license. It's like, oh, is that a real New York driver's license? <laughs> Are they the suits they're wearing in New York now? Um, Oh, you don't need to sit, you know, like they just were gaga over. They were a bit confused because he was Canadian, but from New York, but they were just gaga over. Born in it. Austria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that bit wasn't, they just, he was considered the, you know, the North American. They were just gaga, you know, Australia was involved, uh, saved Australia. America saved Australia during World War II, so we were just gaga over everything American at the time. But the house was in the middle of way beyond suburbia. It was a former mining pottery clay site, so it was out in the bush. It was out very remote there were three houses then he built a house for his parents brother uh, his uncle and the third house which was to be for his brother but the brother's wife didn't want to live there so they're still there these three amazing houses in what is now suburbia but they still have a beautiful out there now are all these houses still in your family or have they passed no it the to... first house rose Seidler house is um a mu house museum Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and they're all got preservation orders. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And so no one's in danger right now, at least of that era? Not of those, but others have gone, of course. You know, the, a lot of the early 50s houses have been demolished. But what's happened with a couple of them, that people have bought them more recently and want to restore them. So that's very nice. Oh, well, the houses of the 1950s, of course, were very modest by today's standards, you know. One bathroom, uh, one car garage, um, and so people want to naturally, I guess, expand them to what people don't. People expect an ensuite bathroom, not sharing it with the whole family. Uh, a lot of times, people are two car families. Uh, they need to. A lot of these houses that people buy need to be expanded and upgraded. But there's a way to do that with it sensitivity. The early houses were, um, in a way, imports from New England, uh, white clapboard timber. Yes. Um, uh, Harry's early houses were more fragile timber, white timber. By 1967, when our own house was finished, his uh, materials became much more substantial, concrete, stone, little maintenance and our house today, which is 50 years old, is still as it was the day it was finished. Still the same furnishing, still... Oh. No, no, add on, <laughs> no, the same kitchen. Uh, it's a, a museum of the 60s, really. You haven't taken your beautiful woods and painted them white or no, something I've done horrible nothing. like it that? It was always his worry. He said, oh, I fear in the future somebody's going to come and paint the concrete white. But they won't in my lifetime, anyway. <laughs> I won't let them. <laughs>
Daryl Delora is a filmmaker of uh, documentaries, digital media, and other kinds of productions, and he has put together a documentary called Harry Seidler Modernist. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you very much, George. How did you get associated with this work, and, and what is your vision of getting out Harry Seidler to the world? Well, um, interestingly enough, I made a film about Jorn Utzon, who built the Sydney Opera House, the architect of the Sydney Opera House. And that I started working on that film way back in 1995. And I met Harry Seidler then, because Harry Seidler was a very strong supporter of Jorn Utzon. And for those that don't know the story of the construction of Sydney Opera House, Woodson was forced out of the project after, basically after he'd finished the exterior of the building, the shells, the podium and the shells sitting on it and all the tiling and all that was pretty much finished. And um, the state government changed hands in New South Wales, in Australia, and the new government wanted to do things very differently and Woodson couldn't continue. So new architects came in and took over. They didn't want to pay him, as I recall. They did not pay him. He he claimed that they owed him $300,000 when he left in 1966. Mm. And he was still claiming that money years later. And uh, eventually uh, he came to an arrangement with the New South Wales government where he became a, um, a sort of c- consultant very much later in the 19... 19- 2000s, I think, mm-hmm. and the only thing he asked for was to be paid that $300,000, <laughs> so things have a funny way of coming around. But the reason I met Harry was that Harry was a very strong supporter of Utzon, and there were demonstrations in the streets, protests by young architects, saying he must come back, he must finish this building, you can't oh, whoa, have... Whoa, 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 you had actual young architects in the street in the protesting? Streets, yeah, we yeah. don't have that in the US, our well, architects don't get out in the you, streets you, and protest. You actually <laughs> see that, this in the film, Harry Seidler Modernist, you see some Super 8 footage of him um, with, a, with a megaphone talking to protesters who are right on the site of the Sydney Opera House while it's being built. And Utzon uh, had been forced out of the country. He left Australia in 1966 and he never returned. And Harry was furious about that. I think he probably remained furious about it till his dying day because it wasn't ever properly redressed. Um, And he, Harry, certainly felt that there should be an apology to Utzon for that. And I was mentioning earlier that there's a joke... Um, an old joke that says Australia has the best opera house in the world. The exterior is in Sydney and the interior is in Melbourne. (laughs) Because, of course, when they changed the building, when they forced Utzon out, they changed it so dramatically that it was unrecognisable from the brief that Utzon had been given. And the interiors really are a shambles and you can't have a proper opera, a big opera can't be performed Mm. in the opera house in Sydney. Um, really? the, mm. the the building was destroyed really by the changes that the government forced on mm. the new architects and that they wanted Utzon to do and he refused to, to do it and he couldn't do it really, it was impossible. Um, and so by changing it in that way, it meant that various things were accommodated like m- many more people could be fitted in, but um, the actual functions of the building was compromised mm. dramatically. Um, so the acoustics that Utzon had spent years working to on perfect, to get actual yes. perfection in an opera house were suddenly just chucked out. They had staging gear in the main um, theatre, the opera theatre, that was all installed and it was ripped out and sent to the local penitentiary for the inmates to chop up for something to do. You know, this was th- tens of thousands mm. of pounds in those days in Australia um, worth of Austrian staging gear that they just chucked out because once they changed their brief of the building, that didn't work for them anymore. So it really is a schmozzle, you know, there, and it's very sad. But Harry Seidler was horrified by that, and he was horrified that an architect who was clearly a modernist master could be forced from his job in that way and for it to be destroyed. So he campaigned for Woodson to return. Never happened. Um, but uh, there were many, many people in Australia who were horrified by that situation. So back in 1995, I interviewed Harry early in the research of that film, and when I met 
met him, I just knew straight away that he would be a wonderful subject for a documentary film. Um, he's such a passionate person about architecture and such a knowledgeable person and such an engaging person to speak to that mm-hmm. you just knew as soon as you met him, wow, this, this guy is incredible. And then, of course, if you saw his buildings where you knew what he was going on about, you know, how powerful they are. And so I tried desperately to make the film for many years, um, but unfortunately the filmmaking authorities in Australia weren't so interested in a film about Harry, and I think that might have something to do with a lot of preconceived ideas about Harry Seidler, because he is a very strong personality, you know. I don't think he, in all the time I knew him, he was never rude to me, he was never aggressive, he was never arrogant, but he was single-mindedly focused. And that's what I found interesting, you know, I found that intriguing. But I think some people couldn't cope with that. Somebody who was just focused on... And if you if you engage with him with that, that was great. But if you didn't, then people felt that, oh, he's being rude to me, he's disengaging, he's not, you know, um, being accepting of, of my place or something. So I think that was an issue. But eventually we made the film, so we persevered and uh, managed, I think... The filmmaking fraternity in Australia came around to our way of thinking, is what I would say, uh, eventually. So, um, yeah, so we made the film last year, and um, it's been very successful. Now, Polly, if people are going to Australia, what are some of the buildings of your father they should definitely go look up? Well, the Rose Seidler house is open every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's a house, as I said, you know, finished late 1950. Otherwise, um, I guess it's his towers in Sydney. The Australia Square project, which is not only... It's like a plaza with a big round tower. There was lots of jokes at the time. Why is Australia Square round? But that's the tower. (laughs) So that was finished in 1967. That was the first time that Harry collaborated with Pierre Luigi Nervi in Italy for the structure. Yes. And it was such a success that later projects he uh, collaborated with um, Pierre Luigi Novi too. The Australian Embassy in Paris, um, Novi did the structure. Other towers in Sydney, the uh, MLC, which was, I think it still is the tallest building in Sydney, but there are a few others coming up now. Um, there are quite most of the buildings are in Sydney, but the other states in Australia also have them. I'll give one more, and then you can, if you're a swimmer, you should go to the Ian Thorpe Aquatic Centre in um, in Ultimo, and that uh, it was designed obviously while my father was alive, but not completed until it's a city government pool, all of, uh, and they name their pools after famous swimmers, and Ian Thorpe agreed. Ah. to have the pool named after him. So it's the Ian Thorpe Aquatic Centre. And if you watch the documentary, that's my role. I'm sw- I'm doing the laps in the pool for the footage. <laughs> and she does them very well, I must say, <laughs> expertly. But, but he didn't just build in Australia, of course. So the film looks at one of his greatest works, which is the Australian Embassy in Paris, ah. which is right on the banks of the Seine and in the, in the foot of the Eiffel Tower. And it's a superb building. So if, if you're going to Paris, you should definitely go and see uh, Harry Seidler's Australian Embassy. And the grand finale project that he worked on was in his hometown of Vienna. He was given a, a large uh, project on the shores of the uh, Danube and he built um, several buildings there of housing and a tower as well. So he enjoyed that very much to be welcomed in his hometown and he won all sorts of medals and stuff like that in Austria. And I think he was more proud of that than any of his other work. So Daryl, where can people access the film? Is it somewhere on Amazon Prime or Netflix or a website? How can they see it? Um, yes, you can. Um, we have a distribution company, filmartmedia.com. Uh, that's, a, that's our company. And if you go there, you'll find links to the film and you can, you can either buy it there on DVD or you can, you can stream it. Um, uh, so it's, it's available there. Um, it, 
of course, is screening here as the US premiere here in, in Palm Springs. And then it'll be screening elsewhere in Canada and the United States as well later. And uh, at this stage, the best way to get it would be from our website, which is filmartmedia, one word, dot com. Filmartmedia.com. Okay, yep. wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all for coming and telling me about Harry and just sharing the story. It's really great to have you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to travel to Palm Springs and hang out with the cool kids, plus George Smart, next February during Modernism Week, that's not Modernism Week in February, that's next February for Modernism Week, send an email to george at ncmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Sarah Sonk, the real estate agent who loves modernist houses just as much as you do. 919-601-7339 and by the fine gentleman at Quality Fabricators of Benson although every time I say that out loud Frank Lloyd Wright rolls over in his grave Okay Tom, take us out Visit usmodernist.org for more information about today's guests U.S. Modernist Radio is edited by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. Show your support by writing a great review of us on iTunes. I'm Tom Guile, George and Frank, and I'll be back in two weeks with another rootin' tootin' Vladimir Putin edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.